Young boys play in the small streets of Barbados, dreaming of one day playing test cricket for the West Indies. The West Indies is a geographical description of an area, no more. And the only thing they really do as the West Indies is play cricket. <laughs> that is more so true of West Indies, I suppose, than anywhere else, especially with the scattered nature of our islands and how we are um, linked together uh, by water there. It, what else do we have but cricket that brings us together? Uh, we've tried a political federation, it just didn't work. But look, with cricket, it's still the test of time and still going. In the summer of 1960-61, a team from these diverse islands in the Caribbean visited Australia. The type of cricket played that one unforgettable summer would impact on the way test cricket was played forever. They came as underdogs, but left as the most popular sporting team to ever visit Australia. This sizzling straight drive takes the score past the 100, and even Benno has to applaud the brilliance of Garfield Stoke. The game in Brisbane was labelled the greatest test match ever played. And here's the single that comes to bat for Australia. He's out, he's out, he's out, he's out. In Adelaide, thousands at the ground and millions of listeners around Australia sat on the edge of their seats as the test match was fought out to a nail-biting climax. A no ball and 20,000 children have rushed onto the Adelaide Oval. And they've all got to get off again. The final test in Melbourne attracted a world record crowd and a perpetual trophy was named in honour of the visiting captain. The West Indian cricketers were accorded the unprecedented honour of a ticker tape farewell. All this in an era when the white Australia policy was still in existence and Indigenous Australians were not even recognised as citizens in their own country. I mean, that's the sort of um, accolade you give to Prime Minister's President and film star, but all they were still in the cricketers, you know, playing that wonderful series. It was a marking point for me, certainly. The arrival of the West Indies team provided the Australian public with their first glimpse of exciting young players, such as Garfield Sobers, who was then the world record holder for the highest score in Test cricket. 365 not out. The dashing Rowan Canhai and the giant fast bowler Wesley Hall. Coming to Australia, I've read so much uh, about Australia. I think every West Indian um, would want to go to Australia. We played very little cricket in the West Indies and to be selected on a tour of Australia, well, that was the moon as far as I was concerned. I was really delighted. In the past, Inter-island rivalries and insularities had often prevented the West Indies from performing well as a team. We had to try and prove to Australia and to ourselves and the people in the West Indies that we were going to perform and we were going to give Australia a run for the, for the men. I think the general uh, mood was that they were very good individually but uh, didn't look as though they were going to be a particularly good team and that was because of the, the results. We knew, the players knew, that they were absolutely devastating and they had some wonderful players there. We knew that we were a fairly unique team but Australia was so strong and um, we had never really um, beaten Australia in a series. The West Indies had only toured Australia on two previous occasions. In 1930-31, the side included the great all-rounder, Leary Constantine, and the man they called the Black Bradman, George Headley. In 1951-52, the team included three star batsmen, Walcott, Weeks and Worrell, the three Ws, and the spin twins, Ramadin and Valentine. 
we grew up under the um, impression that, well, the John Goddards and the Ralph Grants and the Jackie Grants and the Arcade Nunes were of, um, you know, Caucasian, yeah, were the leaders. As part of the island's struggle for self-determination and freedom from colonial rule, C.L.R. James, a writer and political activist from Trinidad, began a campaign to have 36-year-old Frank Worrell appointed as the first black man to captain the West Indies test team on tour. The time was perfect, along with the campaign to get Frank Worrell as captain. And of course he merited on, 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 on every, every account, in fact, not just his colour. But that campaign electrified the people of this country and Trinidad and the whole Caribbean. And as a result, therefore, the selectors had nowhere to go except to make him captain. And it was a perfect choice. When we got Frank Worrell, then we had the first black captain. And that did a lot for the guys that played their hearts out for him. He was um, revered by all the, the players. He, he was looked upon as the sort of big brother, father figure. There's a certain respect for seniority, or a certain respect for being an elder. And therefore, if World said to us, jump, we will ask how high. There's no question that he had the complete allegiance and loyalty of every single member of that squad. The West Indies, as you know, we, we are, we're players that would come from all different islands and all different ethnic groups and backgrounds. And uh, I think Worrell, he created that type of uh, mood where he was able to get us together as a cohesive force. He did a good job in that and said that uh, we are West Indians, we are not trained Indians, or Barbadian, or Jamaicans, or Guyanese. We are all West Indians fighting for the same cause, and we must play as a team. We must play to win the series, but we must play beyond that to win the respect and the friendship of the Australian people. We were ambassadors as well. We could not afford to do anything that was stupid. And Frank, being Frank, being the first colored man to lead the side, we could not afford to let him down. We could not, repeat, not. At the end of the 1950s, Test cricket was in the doldrums. Slow scoring and slow over rates, with England the main culprit, had meant crowds were down and cricket was at a crossroads. The slowness of the game and, and the, the, the over rate that England bowled in 58 uh, doesn't look at all, all that well with the, uh, with the people to go and watch and pay. Well, I remember very much the first test in, uh, in Brisbane where the Englishman only made, I think, 109 in a day remembering it was only a five hour day but it was one of the worst days of cricket of all time and a lot of people said that test cricket was literally going to be dead in Brisbane. In that match, England batsman Trevor Bailey laboured for seven and a half hours scoring just 68 runs. Test cricket was struggling, uh, it was in trouble, uh, we weren't pulling the crowds that uh, perhaps we used to in, in other times. Uh, the, the, the cricket was pretty dour. We had played previously against the MCC. We had six days of five hours cricket. When you got up on the morning of the seventh day, because you had a, a day in between for rest, you know, you were wondering where are you and why are you here? <laughs> because surely something is wrong, you know, this thing's going on and it's dragging out. And cricket at that time had really d descended into a, um, a war of attrition and a tug of war. It was hoped that with the arrival of the West Indies, whose natural attacking style of play was similar to the Australians, the respective captains, Richie Benno and Frank Worrell, would provide the lead and play positive cricket. I went out to meet him and interviewed him for the Sydney Sun, and it was a nice interview and we just chatted about different things and uh, at the end of it I said to him uh, okay well I hope it's a great tour and he turned to walk towards the plane uh, no such things as uh, walkways in those days the plane was just standing there alongside us and he turned around and came back and he said uh, well we'll have a lot of fun and that's exactly what we had you wouldn't get a nice to God in Frankie Worrell um, you know he's, he's a real gentleman and um, and uh, he got on very well with Richie, he got on very well with the rest of the Australian players and we got on very well with him. I think that what made it is the relationship between the two teams. I think the two teams played hard on the field and off the field 
they both join and enjoy themselves, not only at the cricket ground but wherever they're met. And there was no animosity at all between the teams. And I think that that set the pattern and the tone for a tremendous series. Before the first day's play, before the test started, there were five or six Australians and uh, five or six West Indian players in Gary Sober's room playing Calypso records. And I'd never seen that happen before. And that was the way it got off on, on that uh, footing. And uh, it was just, we were, we were mates off the field, but played very hard on the field. didn't have team meetings uh, before 58-9 when I became captain. Might have a few words in the dressing room, I suppose, but uh, no team meetings as such. And I brought that in 58-9. Now, in 1960-61, in December, the night before the test match, um, Bradman asked, could he come along? I talked to the team to see if they were happy with that. That gives you an idea of the different things that uh, happened in those days. And uh, he spoke. And we all listened very carefully to what, whatever Don Bradman said. For obvious reasons, one we regarded him as almost as a, de as a deity until he was a selector. <laughs> but uh, yes, he he was very good. He did, he didn't he didn't he implored perhaps he didn't say you've got to do this. He didn't do that. He just uh, he, he got the message through that cricket needed a good series, and because uh, we'd had a very bad one with England. The gist of it was the selectors will be looking in kindly fashion on those who play the game the way it should be played this summer and provide entertainment. And that caught everyone's attention, I can tell you. It, it was an exciting time for us we, because we'd beaten uh, South Africa in South Africa. Uh, we'd beaten England back here in Australia in 58-9. We'd been to Pakistan and India. We'd beaten them. And really the only team that we hadn't played against was, was uh, the West Indies. And, to, and to, if we could beat them, with their galaxy of stars, well then obviously we'd have to be the best team in the world. You've got to bear in mind that the West Indies were very down at that stage. They'd had a pretty ordinary start to the tour. They'd been knocked off in, uh, let's see, in Perth by WA. Played a draw in the combined match, I think. Got to Adelaide and played a draw. and They beat Victoria. Came up and we knocked them off in three days in Sydney. And then they played another draw in Queensland. So they weren't chock block uh, full of confidence. Frank always tried to drill this into us. He says, look, when the history of this tour is written, you'll find the books will write 90% of it will be on the tests, 10% will be other warm um, state games and upstate games. So the important thing would be the test matches. During that 1966 tour, we were the underdogs. Everybody thought, it, thought that the Australians were going to wipe the floor with us. But um, being the underdogs, we didn't have a lot to lose. And you find that uh, a lot of teams that visit here get beaten by the States on the way around. And this team was no exception. Uh, and when we got to, to Brisbane, you know, when you play a test match, you can't really take things a bit easy and say, oh, we're going to beat this mob, he's just not on. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be there. Uh, so we, we really expected, you know, a fairly tough game, and uh, we certainly got one. Team captains Richie Benno of Australia and Frank Worrell of the West Indies tossed before the start of the first test match at the Wollongabba Ground, Brisbane. And judging by the smile on Frank Worrell's face, he's delighted to win the toss and take first use of the perfect batting pitch. The slightly unnerving thing for me was that uh, someone in the local press in Queensland had written a story that morning that it looked as though I probably had the wood on sobers. And that was very unnerving, I can tell you. I remember playing against New South Wales in Sydney. And Richie had got me out twice. And there was a lot of saying that I couldn't pick Richie, couldn't pick his Google. And I remember sitting in the dressing room on a little table he used to have in the um, players' dressing room outside, sitting there. And it's the first time I ever saw Sir Donald Bradman, he came in. And I was sitting down there, and I must have looked a bit tense and serious, because I remember him coming over to me and saying, Putting his, put his hand on my head and saying, don't you worry, son, he says, you'll get him the right time. 
play resumes with Benno bowling his first over and Sobers welcomes him with typical aggression. Benno was um, effusive and um, had a lot of um, you know, not only ability but he had a lot of flair as a leg spinner and um, Sobers was equally endowed with that type of thing and therefore it was always a contest on and then on that sobers. It didn't matter who won. The point is that um, it's the same thing with Shane Warren and Lara. And Lara. It's always, you know, a statement to be made. This sizzling straight drive takes the score past the hundred and even Benno has to applaud the brilliance of Garfield Sobers. Here Sobers squashes the theory that West Indians can't play spin bowling. To a large extent, the Australian myth is more than true, that we are particularly susceptible to, to good spin, but different strokes for different folks, you, you, that does not apply to Gary Sobers. Sobers passed 50 in 57 minutes, and his innings at this stage included 8 four. This is a timely return to form after his recent string of failures against New South Wales and Queensland. He came in when we needed somebody to do something extraordinary. And Gary is one of those men who I think rises to occasion, even though to that time he's out of form in my view. It was um, one of those occasions again where Frank was there, because Frank and I who got together, and he actually played the second fiddle to me at the other end because I had started to see the ball so well, I started to play shots. And his influence on the batsman he was batting with at the time, like at, when we had him three for 65, guess who was batting with, with Sabi when Sabi started to, to go? Uh, it was Frank Worrell who was, you know, still the, the guardian father, shall we say. These fellows have no respect for reputations and Benno has given village green treatment in this over to Sobers. Sobers was in great form. I know I was at uh, first slip there and occasionally he'd be trying to uh, square cuts or hit shots off the back foot. Richie's toppy, which is a great delivery, he used to cut slide on very quick. And I was absolutely terrified if he got a nick that I was going to get cut in half. But he never did. He just kept smashing. It was probably the best innings I've ever seen play. Even though he was on the other side and I was... Uh having my hands warmed in the covers while I trying to stop those, a few of those cover drives. Um, it's always a pleasure to watch a guy that's that good. He probably had reflexes like Bradman, I think. He, uh, he picked up the line quickly and he picked up the length quickly. Sober 100. century, which was rated by ABC commentator Johnny Moyes as one of the best he has seen in 50 years of cricket. Climb the bowler now to feel the might of this 24-year-old batsman who has just scored his 1000 in test trip. I can remember one ball I bowled to Gary. He was he was in full cry, and, and you know you you trying to change up on him a bit, and I decided to change up on him and bowl a little bit wider, but he's creamed it. And I've got one bloke in the covers called Colin McDonald. Colin hasn't even got down to what it's it's hit him. I put my hand down, it missed my hand, it hit me on the, hit me on the wrist, just above the hand. And uh, that didn't stop it, it bounced off my wrist and then went flying up over my head. Ricocheted, hit the boundary and was back in by his foot before he turned around. <laughs> and that was probably the only shot where he hadn't bisected the field. I think that's the greatest thing was his placement that day, in that it, while his timing and everything was beautiful, it was his placement. He scored 132 in even time, out of form. Think what would happen if he had been in form, you see. Sobers spoons up an easy catch off a full toss from Mecca, and he's out for 132. This great innings lasted only three hours, and it included 21 forms. I had a stroke of good luck. Um, he only made 132, <laughs> but he made a great number of them off me. And I remember after that innings, which Sir Donald said then was one of the best innings ever seen in Australia and he met me as I was coming off and he, he said to me, he said, oh, it's a good thing you couldn't pick Richie. <laughs> With Frank Worrell providing the backbone of the innings, the West Indies set the series alight, scoring at a run a minute, something that particularly delighted the Don. Sir Donald Bradman, I think, was the chairman of the selection committee at the time and he used to come and sit with the players. And he was absolutely delighted at the end of the first day in Brisbane that the West Indies had scored over 300 runs. And he, he, he just kept saying, 
300 in a day. I, 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 I don't believe this, 300 in a day. He sat with you and he, he analyzed the game and he made his predictions. And then he turned to Wes Hall and he said to Wes, well, Wes, how many are you going to get? And Wes had sheepishly turned to Sir Don and said, well, I think, I think I'll make about 10 or 12, you know. And, and Sir Don exploded. He said, imagine that. You go and bowl your heart out day after day, and when you go to bat, you only want to make 10 or 12. You must be mad. And I think this seed was sown. And the big Saturday crowd revels in the display by the giant West Indian Wesley Hall. The big fellow doesn't have any claim to know the finer points of batsmanship, but his technique, whether it's polished or not, is paying dividends. Wesley Hall amuses and delights the crowd with his immaculate defensive movement. Davidson has another crack at Wesley Hall. The young giant cracks back and charges down the pitch. A collision. Down he goes and up to complete two runs with the whole ground in a state of pandemonium. It's wonderful to listen to Wes when he gets, uh, gets his eyes gleaming and starts telling you a story. And he was always a great character on the field as well. Never a dull moment when Wes was batting or bowling or fielding. He was just that sort of player. It's time to attack and Alexander goes for a big hit. Alexander has been batting a long time for his 30 odd run, but he realises that the end is not far away. Jerry, you know, apart from being, you know, a great uh, keeper, he was he had that ability to, you know, he could, he, like he could take after the spinners. He could he, he wasn't afraid to play a loft drive. And the most influential player, I think, in the whole series for West Indies was Jerry Alexander, because Jerry scored, you know, an enormous number of runs in that series. I don't think he failed. He was getting 60s and 70s, and and uh, every time he went out the bat, and he was a real thorn on our side. It was particularly enthusiastic to get up in the morning and said roll on 10 o'clock we ought to go up there and uh, this was a remarkable feeling on a cricket field when I'm telling you we had been through this war of attrition in previous test series. Now Hall has the strike and the crowd settles down for some legalized assault and battery as Ian Meckett moves into bowl. Another four to Hall, 17 runs off the over. A high pitch of excitement as Hall needs one more for his 50. Wesley Hall, 50 runs in 65 minutes and they're loving every minute. After enthralling the crowd with his cavalier batting, Wes Hall turned his attention to hurling his thunderbolts at the Australian batsman. A full toss right at McDonald's head. A fiery opening by the giant bowler. This is real test match heat, with Hall bowling at express speed from the start. The ball is coming to McDonald at 90 miles an hour, but the plucky Victorian opens the Australian scoring with two runs through the packed leg side field. I expected to be able to handle it, but I think, uh, I think Wes Hall raised his sights one run. It was a test match, and uh, I think he was even then faster than I expected. A really vicious ball. Straight at the batsman and McDonald collapses in pain. McDonald was struck just under the heart by a ball which reared up from a little short of a length. McDonald, a tough fellow, is soon ready to face Hall again. I knew I could handle it from a fear point of view, but I didn't expect to have to take so many on the body. McDonald has taken all the ball has to offer, never once flinching from the job at hand. It must be a frightening experience facing this giant bowler, but McDonald is as tough and courageous as they come. This is a graphic close-up as McDonald is struck again. McDonald has taken the worst pounding of his career, and his courage has won him the admiration and respect of every person at the ground. It's significant, too, that every West Indian player, including those from the outfield, have come to offer sympathy. It's the, the ball itself is sewn together with string, which makes up the seam, and that seam is quite prominent, and the, in, the individual bits of string were clearly implanted in my body. You can see the marks. They were, they were blue and red, and the in-between bits were white or a yellowy white. It was quite clear. Then Sobers strikes a great blow for the West Indies. McDonald plays an uppish leg glance and Hunt takes a brilliant catch at leg slip. 
McDonald is out, Fort Hunt bowled sobers for 57, an innings which was rated by experts as one of the most courageous in modern cricket. The stage was now set for Australia's brightest new batting star, Norman O'Neill. When we got to, uh, to Australia, we heard about the successor to Bradman, this Norman O'Neill. And I remember somebody took us over to the club. I don't know if it's Manly or one of these clubs he used to play for in Sydney. One Saturday afternoon, the tour don't start just to show us this guy back. He made a hundred that day too. I said, oh my God, this guy hit the ball hard, you know what I mean? And so we have something to reckon with, you know? I suppose, you know, when you're as good as Normie was, uh, uh, somebody's got to plant that tag on you and unfortunately he got it. It is very hard to be compared to Sir Donald Bradman. And therein lies the story. I mean, you know, if anybody called you a new Bradman, uh, they're nearly putting a curse on you, it seems to me, because it's so much to live up to. Ball works up to top speed, and the success of the Australians rests on the shoulders of O'Neill. A terrible blow, and O'Neill collapses on the pitch in agony. He batted very badly to start with, from memory. He was playing and missing. And doing all sorts of terrible things, but uh, it developed into a very great innings and a memorable innings. If you can get him through the first 30, there was nothing normally you couldn't do. If I had one hour left in my life to watch a person that I admired the most and enjoyed the most from batting, it'd be Norman O'Neill. I just loved watching him bat. I thought he was technically brilliant, he was very correct. His footwork was just fantastic. He's the only player I think I've ever seen who could consistently hit a man of Wes Hall's uh, pace straight back, pass the ball off the back foot with a straight bat. That's a sign of a near genius. Valentine bowls, and O'Neill, with a straight drive, brings up his first century in a test match in Australia. This particular innings in Brisbane was absolutely brilliant. That, I, I would deem that as Normie's best innings he's played in his life. O'Neill attempts a lofted drive, the ball soars high in the air, and Valentine, waiting at mid-off, takes the catch. His total of 181 was his best in a test match. His innings, which lasted 400 minutes, included 22 fours. Australia led by 52 runs on the first innings. A fast swing in Yorker, and so was his team ball. Following on from his five wickets in the first innings, the spearhead of the Australian attack, Alan Davidson, took six wickets in the West Indies' second innings to put Australia in a winning position. Four clean bowls and the West Indians are all out for 284. They have a lead of 232 runs and Australia has just over 300 minutes batting time left to score the run. I thought we could get these even though the ball was uh, was turning a bit. It uh, didn't have a great deal in it for the pace bowlers, but it was a pretty good track. And um, the thing we wanted was a decent start, which we didn't get. Then we wanted a bit in the middle, which we didn't get. Neil Harvey snicks and Sobers takes a brilliant catch. Sobers dislocated his finger taking the ball, and Alexander, a veterinary surgeon by profession, applies first aid. And Wes Hall was bowling at 155 miles an hour, or seemed to be, and uh, he had us really on the ropes. Australia had slumped to five for 57. Alan Davidson again found himself out in the middle. I think I bowled 35 or something in the first dig and about 27 in the second. I've got 40 odd with a bat and, you know, to me I'd been on the field basically the whole of five days and I thought, what the hell's going on here? Like, like I shouldn't be out here. The only thing that satisfied me actually when I walked out in the middle uh, was the fact that there was there was old Slasher and uh, an old Slash was chewing on the cud and as he usually did, he was a really laconic sort of fella, a very dry character and he says, it's not going to be easy. And <laughs> I nearly broke up with that because, <laughs> because of, at the stomach, despite the seriousness of the position, it was just one of those things that... Uh, and of course then he said, um, I'm not, not playing Ramblin too well. He said, find it hard to pick him. Mackay Beaton is clean bowled and Australia with six wickets down is still 141 runs behind. Mackay scored 28 runs and Australia has 92 on the ball. As he walked past said, sorry. And that was about, that was about the end of the conversation. 
But we got to six for 92, chasing 232, and, um, you know, we were gone, absolutely gone to goings. Um, there's no way in the world we're going to get out of this. Frank Whirl seemed to have been keeping a particular eye on me and kept me pretty close to him. So he, there was always a conversation going between the two of us. And uh, I recall quite vividly that when Australia had lost about six wickets, I said to him, we got them. And he said, oh no, not yet. Richie Benno survived an appeal for foot behind of Ramadan's first ball. The Australians have reached the end of their batting lineup, and the result of the match hinges on the performance of the two players at the wickets. And at tea time, we were in such trouble that I uh, was sitting there with Dave Owen. Um, we were talking about uh, quick singles after the break, and we'd see if we could put pressure on them. And the Don came down, and as he always did, came down and had a cup of tea. And he said, well, what's it going to be? And I said to him, well, we're going for a win. But he just said, I'm very pleased to hear it. And as we walked out through the gate, he said, um, well, come on, let's see if we can do it. Australia had to score a run a minute in the final session to win the match. A seemingly impossible task. Davidson and Benno rise to the occasion, and this is the start of a great partnership. We would never un underestimate Richie and, 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 and Devo. And even at that stage, even though we thought we had a chance, we could never be overconfident that we would have won that game. Uh, they were such fantastic players. We knew they were capable of winning it for Australia. Davidson and Benno put on a century partnership and the game is building up to a dramatic climax. That would go down as probably one of the best partnerships that's ever been in Test cricket. Uh, you know, on a fifth day wicket, which is not easy at the best of times. As Paul bowls with a new ball at 20 minutes to six. Davidson with an off drive and Australia wants 23 runs to win. Having Davo there was something of a comfort um, because we'd had all those partnerships in South Africa uh, only a few months before. So I was confident that uh, at least we'd give a decent account of ourselves and uh, that was one of the reasons for going for it. A whole bumper, a vigorous hook shot, an obvious four, 18 runs required. We went for stupid singles, we did all sorts of things, but we, we got in a position to, to make it a great game. 17 runs to win. It's a real grandstand finish, and Richie Benno is getting anxious with 15 minutes left. It's going to be a photo finish result with the whole crowd in a state of feverish excitement. Frank Worth's task was to keep us calm. He said, keep calm, gentlemen, it's not over yet. Part of our problem was that um, we developed a great nervous and anxiety and emotional um, situation at West Indians, especially when things got tight. And he had a remarkable sedatory sort of influence on the boys. and the match to win. A breathless clash as they bow, a tremendous cheer as they score. Nine runs to get, ten minutes to go. Davidson and Benno continued to bat and it got to the stage where I said, well, we've lost, Skipper, we're gone now. He said, oh no, not yet. Richie Benno playing a great captain's hand in this, the greatest test match finish in the long history of the game. I put the whole thing back to Richie where he took, took it up to the West Indians. They played it as the one-day game has played today, he and Alan Davidson. Two great all-rounders, both of them could bat extremely well, and uh, they just took it up. A push to leg, a suicidal run. They scamper home, eight to win. They were taking these cheeky little singles, um, the sort of thing that you just didn't do in, in cricket in those days. And I remember Wally Grout, who was the next man in there. Wally, I reckon, went through a packet of cigarettes. Uh, he, w he was a complete nervous wreck. He's, his hair, he's rubbing his hands through his hair. And I said to Richie, I said, look, I said, we're home, mate. I said, you know, no stupid singles from now on. You know, we don't have to do anything silly. And then we knew that Frank had to keep Wes for a big effort at the last, providing I didn't do something stupid like run Davo out, which I did. So was the bowler. Benno plays the ball to mid-wicket. They start down the pitch and Davidson is run out by a magnificent return from Solomon. Davidson run out for 80. What a grand cricketer he is. 
40 odd runs in the first innings and 11 wickets in the match. When you think that the captain with victory in sight has run out the guy who was just about to win the game, that was particularly stupid. To be quite honest, I was dirty. And he did give a quick head turn, but I was, I was turning the other way. It was, uh, it was far too short a single. I knew as we were crossing that uh, it was going to be in trouble. Yeah, they were playing well. Davis and Ben played well, and we didn't expect to come back in the game. But um, um, I was lucky to get Davis and run out. We knew from the very beginning, in, in, in shell sheet matches, in club matches, wherever Joe played, we knew he had an accurate throw. <laughs> I used to, well, the boys from the country always pitch marbles and tried to steal mangoes, hitting him down. And um, we can say we used to have, we have a good aim. But he had been practicing all along for oh, many years to be accurate in throwing, and that's why he was able to do it. It didn't happen by accident. It was planned part of his training and preparation for test cricket. Seven runs to outright victory with Sabres bowling to grass. Just six more runs. The last ball of Sabres over and Benno trying to keep the strike with only five minutes left for play. And what was going on in the dressing room was Slash Mackay was superstitious and we had to be in our, in our seats by the time the first ball was bowled on every over and we had to be there for the over and if we had to go to the toilet we had to do it between overs so and Slasher was very adamant about that and he, he said that made a big difference if we were if we all sat down and we didn't move we didn't panic until the last over <laughs> and then we did panic <laughs> <laughs> now comes the amazing finish to the test match with Wesley Hall bowling the first ball of the last over the first ball um, hit uh, Wally Grout in the groin, and um, Benno called. He he wanted to finish it. You know, he was batting well. It was the last over, and he called um, Grout. Grout wasn't too keen, and I don't think anybody would if you get a ball traveling at 90 miles an hour full in the groin, and he he, he just hobbled through. When Wally got out there, I uh, was saying to him, "Well, it's just a question of keeping our heads." I think my captain, Sir Frank Ward, he sensed the, um, Benno's anxiety or his eagerness to get on with it. And he said to me, Winfield, don't you bowl a bouncer? And um, I said, OK, sir, I wouldn't bowl a bouncer. But in those days, my bowling a bouncer was conditioned not by whether the captain told me to bowl one or not. It, it was conditioned by how I felt in my run-up. If I felt good, well, that is what you'll get, you know. He was in bowls for Benno. Benno tries to hook him, and he's out! Caught the edge, and he's caught behind by Alexander. Gracious, mate. Eight wickets for 228. Well, what a test match. I turn around, I say, Skipper, we've got him! I, a stony stare. I tell you, I mean, I nearly collapsed. I couldn't believe it. He said, what did I tell you? I said, I, I don't know, you'll have to tell me again. He said, I said not to bowl a bouncer. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry about that. He said, do you realize what would have happened if that had taken the top edge? And I, he said, do you know what the score is? I said, we need 40 wins. He says, exactly. <laughs> I mean, Wesley Hall was a great fast bowler. I think we all forget that he was on his own. I mean, the West Indies as they are today, and they have been, what, for the last 15 or 20 years, they've had three or four of them that have all been great. Wesley did it all on his, on his, on, on his own back. He bowled 20 odd overs, and there were eight ball overs, remember, they weren't six balls. He was still going just as strong in that last over in the, in the Queensland heat. He was a terrifying sight, I can promise you. If you were standing down the end and, you know, he had a run up of about 30 metres, and he really, he did, really did run in very, very hard, and he was a superb athlete. So, I mean, when you're batting at number 10 against a bloke like Wesley Hall, it's not really pretty. I remember the dressing rooms were fairly close to each other, so the players would be sitting down almost adjacent to each other uh, and to look at the faces of those who had to go in. <laughs> Lizzie Clyde, he was pale, pale, pale. I thought, I I'm in this now and um, the over before I thought, gee, I, I, I won't have the bat, this is great. But uh, when Ian went in, that's when I padded up and I thought, you know, I hope they can get through without me going in. Ball now to make it. Moves in on his leg stump. Tries to sweep it and here's a stolen single and he might be run out and hurled it. 
Wes could have taken off and just taken the bounce off. I attempted to throw the wicket down from about two yards and miss <laughs> by a mile. You know, Wes picked this ball up and um, I was supposed to just throw it to Frank Boyle to get the run out and thing, and he, he threw it as hard as he bowled it. And it flew past the stops and I backed it up. That is a good thing that Valentine was there to back it up, otherwise before what was, and we would have lost. I couldn't afford to miss field because the captain had us on our toes. Everybody up, you know, keep on saying, come on, just take it easy, take it easy, we can do it, you know, that kind of stuff. The calmest man in the whole field was Frank Well, The rest of us had to fight hard to keep calm because we were very excited about as a people. Uh, there was barracking going on from the dressing room. Yes, no, we were doing all the calling for the uh, batsmen. And it just built up to this brilliant crescendo. Red sky them. Three of them, four of them getting under it. Can Hoy get to it and it's up. It's up. Four of them converged on the ball. Well, there was no doubt when it uh, grouts sky that ball whose catch it was. I was under it, waiting for it. And then, from no way, there was a black arm over my face. In my mind's eye, I can tell you, I saw that no, no, my excuse is that no fielder attempted to move. Any one of four of us to take the catch. Is Alexander keeping wickets? Can I backwards square? I at mid wicket. Even Frank Whirl at mid on could have taken the catch. Rohan at the time said words to him which could not have been mentioned then or printed and still could not be mentioned in these days. But it wasn't very complimented to his mother or father. <laughs> but Frank Whirl kept us calm. He said, never mind that, we can still do it. And that, I think, saved the situation. Not only that, you know, the scoreboard wasn't working. They'd mucked the, the, you know, I shouldn't say it could only happen in Queensland, but it did. <laughs> the scoreboard operators, I'm sure, didn't know what the score was and they'd, given, they'd, they'd, stopped, they'd stopped operating it. At that stage, I knew Australia needed three runs off three balls. And therefore I sensed that Meckett is bound to have a go at West Hall. And at that pace, 90 miles an hour with the second new ball, is bound to fly. So I quietly dropped back what you should never do on a cricket field, never move before a captain move you. I quietly slipped back a little, a little further back. Goes to Mickey. Mickey pulls him high into the outfield. Four runs. No, it won't get to the fence. They're going for the three, though. Grout slides his bat behind the line. He's flying first, and he's out. Run out. Run out. It would have gone for four if the groundsman had uh, cut the outfield in the morning. When I got down there and saw all the clover there, if you know it grows as you look at it in uh, in Brisbane, I showed him what's happened. You haven't cut the outfield. Oh, got a bit caught up, mate, he said. Uh, ran out of time. I knew my one chance of getting him out on the third round was to throw to Alexander the keeper, not to the bowler. That, that's, a, that's a possible miss. I was conscious that he was running one, running two, and he was turning for the third. And I knew he only had 32 yards, I had 90. And, the, <laughs> and therefore, I could only beat him by the quickest, fastest, lowest throw I had ever thrown. Conrad chased it, and when he picked it up and looked up and turned, the sun must have been directly in his eyes for a fraction of a second. And it was certainly in Jerry Alexander's eyes over there and standing by the stumps. I realized that I could beat him with a throw if I threw quick enough. I had to throw four times as quick as he had to run, you see, in order to get there. It wasn't quite as easy as it looked. And in truth and in fact, I had to actually move to my right in front of the stumps, which actually, um, if I had waited behind the stumps for that come in, I don't think we planned, I don't think we would have got the run out. And so when I got to the ball, just before it got to the boundary, I turned and baseball style, I threw the ball to bounce, first bounce on the square, which is going to give electric pace to Alexander. I, I remember thinking, no, don't drop the ball. And for God's sake, where the hell is a wicket? You know, I had going on the right and figured. It looked as though it all worked out that, well, there was no trouble because the wickets were there. But um, I remember feeling afterwards, thank God for that, because I was quite agitated that in keeping my eye on the ball, holding it and then swirling, swiveling to reach back to the stumps, um, I hadn't missed the stumps. And the throw came in, if it had been half a yard further out, 
then the batsman would have made it. It was a magnificent throw. The crucial point where I'm concerned on that one is the throw from Conrad Hunt to run out Wally Grout. If not, Australia would have won that match. Now the ball only shot stopped nine inches short of the boundary. And I maintain that if the groundsman had to cut the grass before play started, that ball would have rolled into the fence and we'd have won the game by one run. Well, I had trouble finding my batting gloves, I know that. You know, they were somewhere and I finally found them and, and um, out I went. And then I walked past Frank Waller and Frank said, oh, Lindsay, you look a little pale. And uh, I couldn't disagree with that. I suppose I did. Really, all I said to Lindsay, if you hit it, we run. I was running for a win and he was running for a tie. We all knew that this is the last run, and we got to be moving and try to stop it. As a wicked keeper, I was telling myself, as Frank had said, be cool. Now, for God's sake, stay down, because I was worried, my God, suppose he does get an edge. I've got to take it. This is it. I was standing at leg slip, and I remember saying to myself, for God's sake, don't let this ball come down and hurt me, because <laughs> I really would like to make the mistake. The last over that ball was so tense that if you <laughs> weren't strong inside, I don't think you'd have survived. One of the things about captaincy, I think, is you always need to exude the feeling to your players that there's something just around the corner that you're about to pull out of the hat. That may not be so. All this time, Warren was saying to me, um, well, Winfield, um, I have something to tell you. And then when I got there, he said, well, I don't have anything to tell you, but the batsman doesn't know that I don't have anything to tell you. If I move that man at square leg two yards to his right and then move him back two to his left, the batsman still would not notice what had happened. <laughs> he says, one thing I have to tell you. The scores are even right now. You have this ball and another ball to go. Please remember, do not bowl a no ball because if you do, you will never be able to land in Barbados again. <laughs> or the West Indies, with all of those millions of people in the West Indies. <laughs> I had the feeling um, that he went back so far he pushed off the fence, but um, I don't think he quite did that. But I thought to myself, while well, he's running into you, it's taking some time. I wish you'd hurry up and get here because uh, I'm pretty nervous and. Uh, I went over and done with. I planted my foot a good 18 inches, I reckon, behind the crease. So far behind the turn, the popping crease, that if there was a malignant Australian empire, he couldn't even call him no ball. <laughs> And I suppose that I got a bit of a shock when he hit it, so I hesitated. That's my that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Then I got run out, and I got run out pretty easily. The ball was coming to me. I know it was the last run for the Australian to win, and I collected with both hands and not one hand, and I threw the wicket. Um, it went straight in the, in the stump. Did you feel like the boy with the mango again? <laughs> it's a good thing I've had the practice. <laughs> It's tremendous under that pressure to stay at square leg and to see one stump and to hit it under all that tense situation. We, I knew we needed one round to win. And when you go for a quick single like we tried to get, and some guy throws the stumps down from side on with only one stump to aim at, that's a rare occurrence. I suppose we can all accept that um, once. <laughs> but as, as we know, it happened twice. And pandemonium broke out. It was a wild scene. Everybody was excited, upset, worried. He was there as passive as ever, and his knees buckled. I believe it was all that energy in marshalling his forces, and he realized he had not lost the game, and he just sunk, not to the ground, but his knees did buckle as if he had received a, a right hook from Tyson. I tell you what, I didn't know if it was a tie, if we had won, if Australia had won, if the West Indies had won, or if we had lost. I didn't know. And I thought at that time we had won. When the game concluded, I said, oh, we lost by a run. We were not sure. We thought we'd won, if anything, because certainly it wasn't a draw. The only conclusion I came to was we weren't beaten. 
I remember Mekip saying, fancy losing like that. He thought he'd lost because 10 men were out. We had a, a figure in, or I had a figure in my mind of 233 to win. And uh, from that point, we hadn't made 233, and I just thought, well, that's the end of it. We remember running off the field and, and, and querying what really has happened. We haven't won, but we haven't lost. That's, that's it. The two things flashed. But there was no such thing as a tie. Who won, who lost, because it never happened before. And I remember Rohan walking around saying, oh, we've won, we've won. And somebody said, no, the Aussies, we've won, we've won. And then somebody came up with the bright idea, well, let's both teams have won. It's got to be a tie. I thought a tie, that's great. That'll do. It was not in our cricketing upbringing to have a tie. I had known about winning to draw or to lose, but certainly not to tie. I mean, we knew in the dressing room what it was. No one was in the slightest doubt in our side. And it took Richie uh, quite a while to calm me down in the dressing room. It wasn't until I got to the dressing rooms afterwards. I still had my pads on and I grabbed a drink and, I, and Colin McDonald said, what are you looking so ha unhappy for? And I said, we've been beaten. And he said, no, it's a tie. You know, incredible game, um, but I maintain it was a groundsman's fault. <laughs> Frank came in and just slumped in the seat. And he sat there and said absolutely nothing for a while. And he was absolutely knackered. No question about that. So was I, but for a different reason, that we'd, uh, we'd not won a cricket match that we should have won. It hadn't struck me that this is a tie. And then I suppose it was then the Don came in, and I've never seen a bloke with a bigger smile on his face than the Don. He was one of the, he was one of the happiest men I've ever seen. And uh, he said, this is absolutely marvellous. I remember um, betting a half a crown with the Donald and the result of the, of the tie test. And afterwards I said, well, you see, Sir Donald, you didn't, you didn't win that time. He said, yeah, but I was only wrong by one run. <laughs> you know, you, you could never get the last word with him, so. Well, I said to the Don at the end, that's ridiculous, three run outs in that short space of time. And we had it there for the taking. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, you'll find that that is the greatest thing that's ever happened to the game of cricket. I said, well, it's not at the moment. <laughs> but in this case, when you've got a tied test match and both teams can celebrate together, um, I've never seen a, 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 a celebration like it uh, since, before, or will ever do again, I wouldn't think. The fact the tie was played in Brisbane, where basically you share the same viewing areas. Your dressing room has a common wall, so it's not very hard to, to start to talk to the opposition. We had these tables set up, and, and, the, and you had a West Indian and Australian, West Indian and Australian, all the way around, and they were all mixed up in together. The champagne came out and everything at the end of the tide test. And that to me was the, the, the culmination of it all because that was when everybody had been through something massive, something that was, well, unique. It was the first tie in test history. And here were, it was everybody sort of laughing and joking and, and telling stories. <laughs> <laughs> the champagne was flowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly enjoyed that, 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 that evening. I can promise you we did celebrate. <laughs> it was a very heavy celebration. I don't think we left the, the ground until about 10 o'clock that evening. Uh, with the Australians and the, and the West Indian, both together, having drinks and singing and, you know, it, it was a marvellous experience. The team were there drinking a few bears and things like that. and talking and not particularly caring who had won. I think that day cricket won. I was glad to be involved in such a match, you know, because it creates history. And um, I think it will be there forever. Now we knew that we could compete successfully with Australia, who were then world champions, we were the underdogs. We knew from that moment onwards, it's only a matter who played best on the day. And therefore, our confidence in ourselves and our abilities was released. Thank you. 